Good day, good morning. My good name morning. Is, my name is Dr. Vidya Prakash. I'm with Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. And I would like to warmly welcome you to Health for the World Grand Rounds today. It is truly my honor and privilege to introduce, uh, introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Marcella Rodriguez, who's an associate professor um, of pediatric infectious diseases. And Dr. Rodriguez is an outstanding clinician, teacher, and mentor. On a personal note, anytime any of my children uh, get sick, she is my trusted colleague um, and trusted advisor. I trust her with my own children. And so it really is a treat um, to introduce her and she will be sharing her knowledge on fever of unknown origin in pediatrics. And without further ado, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash, for those kind words. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, once again, my name is Marcela Rodriguez. I work at uh, SIU uh, University in Springfield, Illinois, and I'm one of the faculties for pediatric infectious diseases. So today my topic is gonna be a fever of unknown origin in the pediatric population. I don't know why it's not advancing, hold on. Oh yes, there. So um, as an outline, I'm gonna talk initially about a definition of FEO. Uh, I'm gonna go then uh, through the etiologies, which are mainly infectious and non-infectious. Um, I'm gonna touch base about uh, three big entities that we encounter here as uh, FEO, one of which is cat scratch disease, another one Kawasaki disease, and um, the third one is uh, MISC, which is multi-system, uh, multi-inflammatory uh, multi syndrome in children associated with COVID-19. And at the end, I'm going to talk about evaluation of FEO. So as far as definition of fever owner origin, uh, the first study that went through these was back in 1961 by Peter Dove and colleagues. This was done at Yale University, and they looked at 100 adults with uh, FEO. They define FEO then by a single illness with a fever of at least three week duration. They defined fever as a temperature at least of 38.4 degrees Celsius. A fever must occur in most days. And the diagnosis of FEO, uh, um, the diagnosis of the fever remain uncertain after one week of intense evaluation. So there have been subsequently multiple studies looking at these in children, and you can see they have been from 1972, uh, and here it's just a summary until 1998, and multiple definitions have come up. First one uh, after the initial from 1960s came in 1972, where they defined fever as a temperature more than 38.9. The method was rectal temperature, they said the frequency was multiple occasions, and then they talked here for this study that FEO needed to be for three week duration for outpatients and uh, one week duration for inpatients. Subsequently, about five years later in 1977, similar definition came by Lohr, uh, and they defined a fever of 38.4. Fever needed to be there again, multiple occasions, and again, outpatient three weeks and inpatient one week. The most recent uh, from these um, group of studies was in 1998, where they said fever was 38.1 and above. Uh, it should be at least one occasion every day. And then they go, they went down to at least 14 days of fever. So as you can tell, there are multiple definitions. You'll still will find um, different definition in different resources. But to me, the most reasonable definition is a documented daily fever of at least 38.3 degrees Celsius for at least 10 days and without a source despite physical examination and screening laboratory evaluation. So um, here comes different terms about fever. So um, what is an undifferentiated fever? So this is a uh, fever of a previously healthy child 
who presents with high temperature as the chief complaint without any signs or symptoms of a specific clinical illness. So for example, the kid doesn't have any ear pain suggested for acute otitis media, or the patient doesn't have any runny nose congestion suggested by URI. So these undifferentiated fevers, they would be divided in recurrent and prolonged. So on the right-hand side, you will see recurrent, um, and these recurrent fevers will be divided in intermittent fevers and periodic fevers. So intermittent fevers are, um, for example, fevers who, which are presented with auto-inflammatory um, disorders. In these intermittent fevers, the um, interval can vary. So it's not the same interval. So you will see on the right-hand side, uh, there is auto-inflammatory disease here. And you see there is a temperature spike here, another one here. There is this interval. And then there is a, a big period without a fever. And there is another one over here. So th the intervals are not the same. So then periodic fever uh, on the other side uh, are recurrent fevers, but then in this particular uh, group of fevers, the interval would be the same. So one classic example would be periodic uh, PFAPA syndrome, okay, periodic fever after stomatitis pharyngitis syndrome. So we see this frequently in children, and you'll see in this bottom graph that the fevers happen always in the same interval. Basically, the parents can almost predict when the patient is going to have a fever. So we talk about undifferentiated fever. We talk about one type of those, which is recurrent. And then the other one is prolonged. So prolonged uh, has different classes, but this is the one that includes fever of own and origin. Once again, um, there are multiple definitions, as I said before, but the theologies are listed there. I'm gonna go in detail through them. So um, this is just a summary that I found of the different etiologies, like percentages. Um, so of FUO in pediatrics, about half of them would be caused by an infectious cause. About nine to 10% are caused by autoimmune or autoinflammatory conditions. 6% are caused by malignancy. 11% are non-infectious or miscellaneous and almost one quarter of them, 23%, do not have any diagnosis. So you see on the right-hand side, there is this uh, graph that shows the different etiologies from 1970 to 1990s. And they're pretty similar as far as infectious etiologies, you know, close to 50%. But I just want to highlight that, you know, comparing 1970 to 1990s, uh, there have been more uh, cases of FEO where diagnosis haven't been found, unfortunately. So I know this is a busy slide, but I, um, I found these um, a very good classification of the infectious etiologies for FEO. So um, first of all, if we think about FEO, we have to think about focal infections first. Um, so as an example, occult abscesses. So pyogenic or amoebic liver abscesses is an example of that, or um, intra-abdominal abscesses such as spleen, kidney, liver, psoas muscle. And then another focal infection is meningitis, and another one is osteomyelitis. So uh, in older children, these might be a little bit easier to diagnose, but in an infant, Sometimes this is very hard to diagnose. For example, an osteomyelitis, sometimes you know, we, don't, we don't find any focal findings. So sometimes we have to you know, do bone scans or something like that. If we have an FEO, an infant that we don't identify the source. So this can be a little bit tricky to diagnose in younger infants. So another uh, type of infectious etiologies would be bacteria. So examples of those are Salmonella species bacteremia, uh, infective endocarditis that we think is mostly in children who have structurally abnormal hearts, uh, chronic meningococcemia, brucellosis, and rat bite fever. These are just examples. 
One big one uh, is cut scratch disease that I'm gonna go into detail later. Uh, then viruses are uh, also causes of FEO, EVV, CMV, HIV is another one, adenovirus, echoviruses, Kuksaki viruses. And I just wanna stop a little bit on adenovirus because this is a very common virus that we see that can cause prolonged fevers, uh, even longer than 10 days, uh, sometimes two weeks. So this is something that is self-limited, but children will be sick for a very long time. Parasitic causes, and of course, where you're located, some of you see this on a daily basis. Malaria, uh, of course, in the US, this is not endemic, so we have to ask mainly about travel history to start thinking about this. Other things like toxoplasma, babesia, toxoplasmosis, babesia are um, also possibilities. And then some other ones, rickettsia, Lyme disease, and mycoplasma pneumoniae. So um, in the next four slides, I'm gonna go through these BC table. I try to highlight uh, important facts and you're gonna have my slides. You're gonna be able to go through these table. Uh, this is a very good summary of the infectious cause of FEO. Uh, so I'm gonna start with salmonella. So we have to think about salmonella when we have exposure to endemic pathogens, uh, immigration, when patients have a history of um, turtle exposure, chicken, dogs, uh, some certain foods, uh, but spe specifically in the US, we think about salmonella uh, also in returning travelers. Patient would come with high fevers, some mild abdominal pain, and the way we diagnose this is mainly by blood culture. Sometimes if we have bone marrow, we also would find salmonella in the, um, in the bone marrow culture. Bartonella Hensley, I'm gonna stop here because I'm gonna talk about it later. Um, mycobacterium tuberculosis is something that we have to think of where you are located. If this is endemic, this is something that you will see very frequently. For us, we don't see it frequently, but we think about these in returner travelers or patients with high risk who live in, for example, in uh, nursing homes or um, in prison. Uh, we have to think about uh, MTB depending on the risk factors. For these mainly, you know, we do the screening, which is uh, tuberculin skin test, interferon gamma release assays, and chest X-ray. And of course, if we're really thinking about it, we send um, sputum cultures or gastric aspirate cultures mainly in pediatrics because you know kids don't expectorate. So sometimes we have to admit kids to get an NG down and get gastric aspirate cultures. So then some other ones, malaria. Um, once again, it depends on the risk factors where you are located at. We mainly think in the US about malaria and returning travelers. Um, then brucella species. Uh, this is something that we don't see very frequently, but you know, risk factors for this would be exposure to cattle, swine, household member who is a veterinarian or farmer. Dogs, especially beagles, are another source of brucella in humans. Raw milk rarely cause, uh, is ra rarely caused in the U.S. because of control of brucella, brucellosis in cattle. Um, remember, as far as diagnosis, uh, this has high yield in blood, blood marrow culture. Uh, and then I forgot about other risk factor, imported goat cheese. So this patient would present with high spike in fever, arthralgias, hepatomegaly, elevated liver enzymes, and um, serologies and PCR and cultures are the way we diagnose it. Parvovirus B19, just a few points that I wanna highlight. So patients would present with fever, joint pain, a rash that can exacerbate with temperature changes. Like after a hot um, shower, you can have a worsening rash with uh, parvovirus. Mainly you can see that also in hands and feet. Uh, we diagnose this by serology and blood PCR. Next one I wanna mention is Francis Tularensis. We see this mainly in the summer months here. Uh, you have to think about it when you have exposure to ticks, uh, fleas, mites, your flies. The way we see it is mainly ulceroglandular. So patient would come with you know, an enlarged lymph node, but there are some other types such as uh, typhoidal um, uh, pneumonia 
and we diagnose this mainly by serology, but also can be diagnosed by PCR. Leptospirosis, um, so you have to look in the history about exposure to rodents, domestic animals, a uh, patient would come with persistent fever or biphasic fever, so they have a fever for some time, then the fever goes away and then it comes back. Patient would come with aseptic meningitis and hepatitis, and we diagnose this with serology. Leishmania, we don't see it very frequently. I was looking, and actually in East Africa, it is present, so it's something to think of, depending on where you're located. Then next one will be tick-related illnesses caused by rickettsia, ehrlichiosis, anaplasma. So I'm in the Midwest, I'm in Springfield, Illinois, and here where I am, we have um, uh, some ehrlichiosis and uh, Rocky Mountain's body fever sometimes. Uh, so we, particularly in the summertime, we ask about exposure to ticks. Then um, Main symptoms will be, of course, fever, since we're talking about this. And then um, labs are very uh, remarkable for uh, cytopenias. Patient would come also with headache, malaise. And the way we diagnose this is mainly serologies. We have some blood PCR for early kiosis, too. Uh, another entity, a Babesia, is one. Um, it, similar to how patients with malaria would present, but the, we only see these here in the US in the Northeast and Upper Midwest. So here in the Midwest, I have not seen a case of Babesia, but depending where you are, you have to think about it. Histoplasma capsulatum, this is something that we see here a lot. This is endemic in the Midwest. So this is actually one of the top causes of FEO that we think of when we have a patient presenting with prolonged fevers. So you would have, um, Basically, prolonged fevers, you can have hepatosplenomegaly if you have disseminated disease, you will have pneumonia, and the way to diagnose this will be serologies, um, and we also do antigen detection in urine and blood. HIV, of course, is something that we have to think of. Fortunately, here, we don't have a lot of pediatric HIV cases, but depending where you are and depending on how um, control is the uh, transmission from mom to baby, you know, you have to think about these. So basically patients would come with prolonged fevers, hepatosplenomegaly, mononucleosis-like syndrome, hypergamma globulinemia, recurrent infections, and we diagnose these with uh, PCR and serology. Endocarditis, as I said before, we have to think about it in patients with abnormally structural hearts, and patients would come with fever, malaise, weakness, splenomegaly, a new heart murmur, anemia. And the way to diagnose this would be blood cultures, echocardiogram. And sometimes we have to order specific PCR to certain pathogens. And lastly, um, intra-abdominal or retroperitoneal abscess, retropharyngeal abscesses. So patients would come with some localized pain or tenderness elevated inflammatory markers. Sometimes they come with positive blood cultures. As I mentioned, in infants, sometimes it's hard to identify these, and sometimes we have to do some scanning of them. We have to, if at some point after we do some like detailed blood work, if we don't find anything, we end up doing a full body CT, like chest, abdomen, pelvis, to look for potential causes of FEO. Same as pelvic or vertebral osteomyelitis, uh, and odontogenic infections. So history is very important, recent dental work, recent cavities, um, look, you know, do a very detailed examination looking for these potential sources. So some important facts. I know I talked about so many different infectious etiologies and it seems like very long list and sometimes we're like, where do I start? But things, to remember, so in children who are less than six years of age, they're more likely to have an infectious cause of FEO, which is very important to know because this can give reassurance to the parents. You know, a lot of times parents are very worried about malignancy, about cancer. So in a child who is less than six years of age, most likely cause is gonna be infectious, which I would say is good news because we can, solve this, we can make this better. 
older children and adolescents with FEO, they're more likely to have an autoimmune or autoinflammatory disorder. Among the most common infections identified um, causes in recent studies are EBV, Bartonella Hensley, kidney and urinary tract infections, and osteomyelitis. And then there are some agents that cause granulomatous infections, such as Bartonella, Mycobacterium, Salmonella, Histo, Brucella, and Francisella. These are disproportionately causes of FEO, and they frequently involve visceral organs and bone marrow. So I talked quite a bit about infectious etiologies, but remember, we talk about 50% are infectious, but there is a good proportion of patients that would have non-infectious causes of, unknown, of fever of unknown origin. So uh, Kawasaki disease is the most common miscellaneous diagnosis in developed countries. So we see that here frequently. Uh, and then some other ones such as autoimmune diseases, anti-inflammatory disorder, such as uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, GIA, inflammatory bowel disease, or SLE, systemic leukose erythematose, are causes of FUO. And then malignancy, um, such as leukemia, lymphoma, sometimes neuroblastoma, can also be non-infectious cause of FEO. And you see in the bottom part of this table, there's some other things that I'm not gonna go through in detail, but drugs, for example, can be you know, a cause of FEO. And this is, of course, a diagnosis of exclusion, but sometimes we have to go through the medication record when we have inpatients and see what could potentially be causing this. Sometimes antibiotics can even cause fever. So um, as I said, this is a diagnosis of exclusion, but we have to go through all of these after we have ruled out the most common things. Okay, so in the next few minutes, I'm gonna go through uh, cat scratch disease, Kawasaki disease, and MISC. So um, cat scratch disease is actually something that we see, um, I would say, not very frequently, but we see um, some cases of cat scratch disease. This is, called, this is caused by Bartonella Hensley. Uh, cats are the natural reservoir. Um, and in general, uh, children, most of them would come with localized disease. Uh, they come with cutaneous and regional lymphadenopathy disorder. As you see in the picture, this is a patient that has axillary lymphadenopathy caused by Bartonella. You would have to get very good social history, exposure to cats and kittens in particular. Um, just do a very good skin examination because you're gonna be able to find the port of entry, the site of inoculation in about two thirds of the patients. Uh, you'll find a skin papule or pustule that develops within 12 days uh, at the site of inoculation. Uh, the lymphadenopathy in general will resolve in two to four months. Uh, so supportive care is uh, what is recommended most of the time, but sometimes when they're very severe, we end up giving antibiotics and sometimes we do needle aspiration to relieve some of the pressure. Less common presentation of cat scratch disease will be culture negative endocarditis, encephalopathy, pneumonia, and also cat scratch disease, remember they use their ocular manifestation that would present as this parinot oculoglandular syndrome. So patient would come with follicular conjunctivitis and ipsilateral preauricular lymphadenopathy. Not very commonly with cat scratch, with Bartonella Hensley infection, we see systemic cat scratch disease. So this is the one that causes fever of own and origin in children. So this is, is a small proportion of cases of kids that have Bartonella Hensley infection would present like this they would come with this prolonged fever for one to three weeks. And they would come with malaise, listlessness, myalgia, arthralgia. They would come with some weight loss, abdominal pain. This can be severe. And they would have hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. If you do an abdominal ultrasound, you might find multiple microabscesses or granulomas of the liver or spleen. So, at least for me in my practice, I, you know, if I have a child who comes with FEO, most of the time I do a, a screening abdominal ultrasound. I think this would give you very good uh, information about 
the abdomen, potential intra-abdominal abscesses, potential, you know, micro abscesses in the spleen or liver, uh, it would help you confirm or ruling out hepatosplenomegaly. I think this is a very good test. It can confirm also pyelonephritis, kidney masses, kidney changes. So I think this is a very good test. And for example, for cut scratch disease, you're suspecting that if you find micro abscesses in spleen or liver, this could be a diagnosis. So diagnosis, how we diagnose patients basically with cut scratch disease, uh, serology or uh, PCR of specific tissue, and treatment is mainly supportive, as I said before, in case with lymphadenopathy, we just wait until they get better. But if it's very symptomatic and particularly in systemic disease, yes, we give antibiotic, which is acetromycin plus minus rifampin. So Kawasaki disease. Um, so we see these, um, I would say frequently in the US, um, this is a acute self-limited vasculitis of unknown etiology that occurs primarily in infants and young children. It happens in one in 100 children in Japan. Uh, and I know the lowest incidence uh, is reported in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we see that, as I said, mainly in Asian pediatric patients and African-American, Hispanic and Caucasian. This happens in young children. The median age is about two years of age. Uh, but 75% of three quarters of patients are usually less than five. If you have a young child infant, they're gonna be more likely to have complications. They're more difficult to diagnose because they usually will present with incomplete presentation. And in the US, we see Kawasaki disease mainly in the winter and early spring. So principal clinical findings of Kawasaki disease, cardinal feature is a fever for at least five days or more. And then you would have to have four of five principal features. I'm going to go into details about them uh, shortly. And you have to exclude diseases with similar findings. So basically, Kawasaki is a diagnosis of exclusion. So uh, the cause of Kawasaki is still unknown. Uh, infectious etiology has been strongly suspected based on clinical and epi features mainly because it happens in uh, epidemics, kind of like with wave-like spread. It happens mainly in certain times of the year, winter and spring, um, but we haven't been able to find a specific infectious etiology. So these are potential etiologies that have been looked at for the Kawasaki, but nothing has been proven to be real related to it. So we don't, we don't have a known and proven infectious cause for Kawasaki disease. So the cardinal feature, as I said, is fever that has to be at least for five days. There are very high fevers, 39 degrees or higher. Um, fever doesn't go away uh, without um, therapy for Kawasaki disease. Um, and usually the mean is for 11 days, but up to four weeks. They are very high spiking and remittent. They would come back and back and back. And usually after you give appropriate therapy for Kawasaki, they resolve within 24 to 48 hours. So we talked that there are five cardinal features of Kawasaki. So I'm going to go through the first one, which is extremity changes. So patients would present in the acute phase of the disease with erythema of palms and soles. You see also some like edema or induration of hands and feet. And then in the subacute phase of the disease in uh, week two or three, you will see some desquamation of fingers and toes. This is very significant. It is not subtle. You'll see significant desquamation. I think I skipped one. So the next one is um, a rash. So this rash is a polymorphic exanthem, and, and this appears within five days of fever. Mostly, this is a diffuse maculopapular eruption that can be uh, presented in different ways, or so urticarial, scarlatiniform, erythroderma, erythema multiforme like or microfistular. It can be present in the trunk and extremities. In toddlers, in fans, it can be accentuated in the diaper area, perineal region. But one thing that the rash of Kawasaki disease doesn't present uh, like is this is not bullous or not vesicular. 
Next one is, I think I skipped one, sorry. Uh, conjunctivitis. So patients with Kawasaki disease, they would appear with conjunctivitis. This started happening shortly after the onset of fever. This is a bilateral non-exudative painless conjunctivitis and usually spares the limbus. The next one is changes in the uh, oral mucosa, leaves and oral cavity. So this is the classic entity that would, kids would come with a strawberry tongue. They have erythema of the oral mucosa, dryness, fissuring, peeling, cracking, and bleeding of the lips. Uh, they would have no ulcers. So if you have a child that comes with fever and they have intraoral ulcers, that's not Kawasaki, okay? But if they have strawberry tongue, inflamed lips, erythema of the pharynx or of the oral mucosa, Think about this. Lastly, cervical lymphadenopathy. So children with Kawasaki would present with unilateral lymphadenopathy. Usually these lymph nodes are big. They're more than one and a half centimeter in diameter. They're firm, they're non-fluctuant. And a lot of children we admit and uh, with a presumptive diagnosis of maybe a retropharyngeal abscess, and we give them antibiotics, and later on, this doesn't go away, they have conjunctivitis, rashes, and they, we end up diagnosing them with Kawasaki disease. So something to think of when you have a kid that comes with prolonged fever and cervical lymphadenopathy. So the main thing we hear about Kawasaki disease is the coronary artery changes. Remember, this is a disease of medium-sized vessels, and this is the main thing we want to prevent. So if you have a child that comes with fever for more than five days, but they don't meet criteria for Kawasaki and you do an echo and they have coronary changes, you can definitely diagnose Kawasaki and treat them right away. So um, as I said, Kawasaki is a diagnosis of exclusion. So besides your clinical uh, suspicions, you do some blood work and uh, laboratory findings that are very suggestive of these will be Leukocytosis while white blood cell count more than 15,000. You have increase in uh, infl uh, inflammation markers, CRP and set rate, um, increase in platelets mainly in the second week, increase in liver enzymes. You have anemia for age, you have hypovolemia and hyponatremia. Some other things that we see will be sterile pyuria. So I would say in every child that comes with FEO, always do a UA, urine culture, and if you have a pyuria, but your urine culture is negative, then think about possibility of Kawasaki. CSF pleocytosis is another thing that we see in kids with Kawasaki. Of course, we don't tap every single child that we suspect Kawasaki, but it's something that we see. Uh, also, abnormal plasma lipids and leukocytosis in the synovial fluid. So not every child would come with the four criteria for Kawasaki disease. So sometimes they're hard to diagnose and they would come with incomplete features. So this is an algorithm that uh, is in the guidelines published in circulation in uh, 2017. Very good paper that I would recommend to go and review if you're interested to look more into Kawasaki. And this guides you through what to do when you have a child that doesn't meet all criteria. So diagnosis is basically clinical diagnosis. If you have uh, four of the principal features, um, and you diagnose some other things, you can make a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. Uh, if you have a young child with fever for more than five days with any of the clinical features, you have to suspect it. And you have any young infant less than six months of age with prolonged fever, even without principal feature, you have to suspect it as well. So these are the differential diagnosis. So every child that comes with prolonged fever, I do over here um, a biofire for the multiple respiratory viruses. We have here the fortune to have a, a test called multiplex PCR that checks for multiple viruses. Um, but I would definitely rule out uh, viruses. And one of those big ones is adenovirus. And when we have an adenovirus positive test, you know, these actually give us some relief that, you know, we don't have to worry about some other things. Um, so adenovirus is a big one, enteroviruses, EBV, measles in unvaccinated patients. Think about scarlet fever. Remember, there are some 
similar features as from Kawasaki and scarlet fever. You have the rash, you have the strawberry tongue, you have the fever. Uh, so think about it, toxic shock too, stuff scalded skin. Bacterial cervical lymphadenitis, as I said, they will come with unilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. And depending on where you are in, in the summertime here, because we are an area where we see it, early heliosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, Steven Johnson, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, leptospirosis. So how we treat Kawasaki, and I'm gonna go through, I'm not gonna go through every single detail, but in, in a nutshell, we give IVIG and we give initial high dose aspirin. And then when they're febrile, we go down to low dose aspirin. We do echocardiograms. We do at baseline at two weeks and six to eight weeks after the initial diagnosis. Uh, untreated patients with Kawasaki, about 15 to 25% of them will develop coronary artery changes. And of the ones that you treat with IVIG, 5% of, of them would have um, coronary changes too. So you drop from 25% to 5%. Um, how do we, so there's some children that have IVIG resistance. Uh, so you treat them and they don't respond. So 10 to 20% of them would have um, not response to IVIG. So how would we treat those? We retreat with IVIG. Uh, we can give steroids and sometimes we give immunomodulators such as infleximab. Okay, so about um, another entity that came with the COVID-19 pandemic is multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. We uh, shortly, we say it MISC. So I just wanna mention these because uh, this is one of the things that we think of right now that we have a kid with unexplained fevers. Uh, we don't see it as frequently anymore because we're not seeing that many COVID-19 cases, but we still have some in the community that we think of these and then, through the whole pandemic, we actually had some time when we saw quite a bit of these. So the CDC case definition of MISC is um, a patient who is less than 21 years of age who present with fever. They have laboratory evidence of inflammation and they have severely um, clinically illness requiring hospitalization. And they have, they have more than two organ system involvement. Uh, they don't have any other alternative diagnosis and they have an epilink to COVID-19 uh, in the four weeks prior, so one month prior. So there are classifications of MISC and um, class one is typical MISC. So in this particular group of patients, 98% um, of them would have serologies positive for COVID-19. Uh, all of them would have some cardiovascular involvement. So they would come with tachycardia, hypotension, they have myocarditis. Actually 98%, a very big amount of patients would come with GI symptoms. So vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. They have significantly high inflammation markers, set rate, CRP, and a good amount of these patients, 84% would require to be admitted to the ICU. So these group of patients are actually very, very sick. The next group of patients is class two. This patient would come with uh, combined acute COVID-19 and MISC combo. So these patients have 16% um, serology, different from the first group that had 100% positive serology, but actually all of them would come with positive PCR for COVID-19. This group of patients would have more respiratory symptoms, pneumonia, um, and then 62% will require to be admitted to the ICU. Lastly, class three, this patient would present with milder disease. So these would be kids who come with more Kawasaki-like features, such as rash, mucocutaneous lesions, and less than half of them would be to be admitted in the ICU. So this uh, is an MMNWR report back in 2020, uh, two and a half years ago, where they look at 570 kids with MISC, and they found what I just described, about one third of patients with severe illness, with shock and cardiac dysfunction, 30% with overlap of acute COVID-19 symptoms, and 35% with feature of Kawasaki. So similar to the presentation that I just described, class one, class two, and class three.
So uh, most common presentations on kids with MISC, so abdominal pain, 61, 62, 62%, vomiting, skin rashes, about half of them, diarrhea, hypotension, half of them, conjunctival injection. So as you can tell here, there are similarities to Kawasaki. So sometimes it's hard to differentiate what it is if it's Kawasaki or MISC. Treatment, it's similar, but sometimes it's very hard to differentiate because if you can tell conjunctivitis, rash, or mucosal changes, all those are things that overlap between one or the other entity. So patients would present with severe complications in um, 40% of cases for cardiac dysfunction. They also would present with shock, myocarditis, acute kidney injury, and coronary artery dilation. I have to say that kids with MISC have more chances to present way sicker than kids with Kawasaki. As far as labs, I want to highlight some differences between the two entities. So in MISC, we take kids with a lymphopenia. We also see kids with increasing troponin and BNP. We don't routinely check for these for Kawasaki disease patients. We see patients with thrombocytopenia, and in Kawasaki, we see them more with thrombocytosis. And also, D-dimer and fibrinogen would be high in these patients. So this is an algorithm, and I'm not going to go through these. I know this is very small, but this is an algorithm that we follow locally. We follow this from Washington University in St. Louis, how to manage these children with, um, with presumptive MISC. And this is just a, a summary of how we treat them. This came from the American College of Rheumatology that basically says that if we give combined IVIG and steroids in every single patient, we have less treatment failure. Uh, we have faster recovery of heart and function, and we have shorter ICU stay. Uh, initially, when we just started having patients, we were giving only IVIG. Then later, when they were worse, we were giving steroids. But now, if we have a real diagnosed case, we give both IVIG and steroids. OK, so uh, we talk about Kawasaki in detail. We talk about MISC. Uh, there are some other non-infectious etiologies of FEO that I'm going to talk about one more because, of course, there are multiple. It's impossible to cover every single one in just an hour. But I just want to highlight uh, JIA, which is juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, this is a familiar and sporadic disease. Uh, the risk is higher in female patients. And these uh, patients would present with um, prolonged fevers. Uh, they can happen once or twice a day in the late afternoon or early evening. Remember, this is a systemic disease. So patients would come with hepalomegaly, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. They would present with a rash, which is evanescent. Uh, it can be red or salmon in color. Um, and it gets worse when you have, patients have fever. Um, patients, of course, would have arthritis, shoulders, knees pain. Um, they have difficulty flexing the spine. Um, as far as labs, anemia, elevated inflammatory markers, and treatment initially with the NSAIDs. Of course, when we suspect these, and we have ruled out some other entities, we refer to pediatric rheumatology. But just think about this when you have a kid that has prolonged fever, hepatosplenomegaly, increased inflammation markers, and you still don't find a cause. So lastly, in my um, last two slides, I'm going to go through the evaluation of a child who has FEO. So of course, you know, history is very important. Uh, duration of symptoms, associated symptoms, how do they take the temperature? Uh, which route are they using? Are they checking the thermometer works properly? Have they checked the, you know, have they changed the thermometer? I have had cases that we admit them and they don't have any fevers in house, and actually the thermometer was not working properly. So before you embark to do a very expensive and thorough evaluation, just just make sure you have a confirmed diagnosis. Uh, get exposure history, social history, travel history, um, diet history. Uh, sick contacts, um, 
then your physical examination has to be very, very um, detailed, growth chart, um, look at very careful organ-specific exam, uh, look at the mouth in detail, mouth ulcers, look at the teeth, dentition, uh, cavities, look at the, the skin, look at rash, look at the genital area, joint abnormalities, lymph nodes. Then after you do your very detailed uh, history and physical examination, then you would have to do your routine screening tests that uh, we always do, such as CBC with differential. Uh, we do inflammation markers that rate CRP. We do screening chemistry tests to look for abnormalities in liver enzymes or abnormalities in renal uh, uh, function test. Um, we do recommend to do a urinalysis urine culture, particularly in female patients. I would recommend in a patient with FEO, always do a chest x-ray. Uh, we don't do it routinely in a child that has like two, three days of fever and cough, but if you have a child that has two weeks of fever, for sure, I would do a screening chest x-ray. Um, other imaging would be recommended, you know, as directed based on your history, but for me, a very easy to do screening test would be an abdominal ultrasound. I would do always a blood culture. And then your serologic evaluation on particularly directed uh, tests for particular ID uh, causes would be based on you know, your exposure, your risk factors. So what I would recommend, um, if you are in the ED or you decide to admit a patient to the floor before you refer to ID, or even if, if you don't have ID, I would say do your initial screening labs, CBC with differential, inflammation markers, UA, CMP, uric acid, and LDH. And we do recommend this looking for malignancies. Do blood cultures, urine culture. Look for specific serology. So look for EVV, CMV, Martonella Hensley, if you have cat exposure. Tick smear, depending where you are, looking for malaria. I bet this is very frequently where you're located. TB quantiferon gold. And then imaging studies. I would say at least chest X-ray in all patients and abdominal ultrasound in most patients, because this is easy to perform and they will give you a lot of information. Echocardiogram is important to do also. If you have done already your chest X-ray, abdominal ultrasound, you have to look for endocarditis. Then you can decide about inpatient or outpatient management. So sometimes we do uh, outpatient management we do all this work up as an outpatient. Of course, this takes just longer time for us to have results. Sometimes we just admit to confirm if this is really an FEO. Um, and then the management will be done. I mean, the workup will be done a little bit faster. Um, we do stop some, most, some medications. And something that I do recommend is do not uh, start antibiotics unless you have a reason for it. If you still don't know your cause of FEO, I would say do not start antibiotics unless your patient is critically ill. If you have a kid that has had fevers for three weeks and you don't find a source, why would you start? And why would you start? So I would say do not start antibiotics uh, until you get um, some workup back. And I know it seems like parents will be super anxious about not doing anything, but we're not sitting. We're just waiting for evaluation. But Starting an antibiotic can actually just make the picture a little bit more confusing. So I would say do not start unless you have very particular and specific indications for this. I skip one. Then some further evaluation. So if you think about, okay, I have ruled out most of the common infectious etiologies, then start looking at some, you know, not very common. So for example, for us, we start looking always at EBV, CMV, respiratory viruses, UTI, blood cultures. But if nothing comes back positive, then we start looking at histo, blasto. Uh, we, we do uh, look for IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, looking at occult blood in stool. We start looking at um, imaging. Like if your initial screening chest X-ray and abdominal ultrasound is negative, we actually do scan these children. We do chest, abdomen, pelvis, CT. If all our workup for infectious etiologies 
you know, doesn't reveal anything, then we call hematology oncology to evaluate these children to see if they can do a bone marrow uh, aspiration. Uh, and we send that for the um, path and cultures. And further, if we don't find anything, then we call our colleagues. We don't have local pediatric rheumatology, but sometimes we have to, you know, send them to them also outpatient or even transfer them to look for some autoimmune or rheumatologic conditions. So um, this was a brief summary of FUO. Um, I know this is a very prolonged topic and there's so many potential causes. Uh, I just tried to, you know, summarize. Just, um, just remember um, FEO is something that we see in children and 50% of them are infectious in etiologies, but sometimes we don't find the cause. Sometimes, you know, patients just get better and uh, we just didn't know what it was, but um, there is a lot of workup that we can do. Not every single patient needs every single workup, just do your uh, workup targeted for the patient. So with this, I will end and I will be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much. That was very informative, especially when something like fever of unknown origin has such a broad differential. So it was nice to go through and see all the different causes and etiologies and how we should work them up. You're very welcome. Any questions for Dr. Rodriguez? Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, well, special thanks to Dr. Rodriguez for a very informative uh, talk about fever of unknown origin in children. Now, this is an internal medicine residency, but we do get the opportunity to manage uh, children. And we do have patients whom we classify with as having fever of unknown origin. So this was very useful to us. Thank you very much. Now I had You're a very welcome. questions. Yes. So I had a couple of questions and I think uh, maybe some other members in the group as well. So the very first one was about uh, other investigations like procalcitonin. Like how useful is, is that in your practice when you are assessing these patients with FUO? And you did mention not providing antibiotics to this patient. Could that be something that pushes you further to consider antibiotic therapy in them? Yeah, and, so. Uh, the, yeah, please go on. So your first question about procalcitonin, you know, this is an inflammation markers. Uh, it's um, such as set rate and CRP they're not very uh, specific. So basically it would show that there is inflammation, but it doesn't give you an answer where the inflammation is coming from. So depending on where you are, at least locally, what we have here in our hospital, we have CRP and set rate. We don't have procalcitonin. Some other institutions have procalcitonin. Uh, so it, it's helpful to know and helpful maybe to trend, but um, it's not gonna give you any, um, details about what the source is from inflammation. So um, it's, I would say it's, if you have it, you can order it. And if it's elevated, just basically have to look for the cause of your, of your inflammation, but it's not a very, you know, uh, very good test as far as giving you etiology. Um, as far as antibiotic, yes. So we don't, if you have a, a kid that come with, a prolonged fever for two weeks, uh, three weeks, and you don't find a source on your exam, which that basically would give you your definition of FEO. You don't have a pneumonia. You don't have an ear infection. You don't found a UTI in the UA. Uh, you do your screening um, abdominal ultrasound. You don't find any sources. So you shouldn't start antibiotics because what are you treating, right? At, at least right now in your first 24 hours, you just did a screening test. 
for a lot of things and you don't find a source. So we do not recommend to start antibiotics unless you have a real high index of suspicion. Okay, I'm treating A, B, or C because one, if you decide to treat, what are you treating? And then second, which antibiotics are you going to pick, right? You have to know what you're treating to decide your empiric antibiotic. So not necessarily you need to give them antibiotic and, you know, until, unless you have a real clear reason for the fever. I know it's hard not to give antibiotic. You have a child that comes for three weeks, but what are you going to give? Are you going to give broad spectrum antibiotic? Um, if they have been sick for three weeks, I think you can still wait a couple of days before you make that decision about starting antibiotics. Well, thank you very much for that. So the other question I was going to ask actually about your threshold for imaging in the pediatric population, but I think you answered that already with your slide on evaluation of children with FUO. So I'm going to skip that. Now, infective endocarditis is actually a documented etiology of FUO and some of the common organisms like HASEC uh more difficult to culture it takes longer to culture now our tradition our practice here is that the lab when you get the blood sample to them after five to seven days if there's nothing they usually discard <clears throat> now in your practice is it routine for cultures to go for longer than <clears throat> seven to 21 days do you have to specify that when ordering the test uh, especially when considering infective endocarditis in these patients yeah, that's a very good question. So routinely our blood culture, they run for five days. If you have particular concern about some uh, slow growing organism, then you have to call microbiology and tell them specifically, I want you to hold this because I'm looking for this particular organism and they would hold it longer. Uh, but routinely we only hold it for five days. So in our context, we are a little bit uh, limited in our ability to investigate. But most of the things you mentioned, we, we don't have serologic tests for brucella, for leptospirosis, for francisella tular, for tularemia. And it really limits our ability to establish these diagnoses. Now, in the adult population, when we have a patient coming in with FUO, it's usually nice when the history guide us or when... When we have a lymph node, for example, that we can stick and set in for cytology, and tuberculosis in that population is, is actually greater. It's, it's much more significant in our population. But occasionally, when we cannot establish a diagnosis and we strongly suspect a zoonotic infection, maybe because they have cattle at home, maybe because they have sheep, et cetera, occasionally we find ourselves giving doxycycline to these patients. And... We do get some responses. Maybe it was a self-limited infection that was going to get better anyway, maybe not. So just was curious about what comment you would make about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very good thought. Sometimes we also, if we have a high index of suspicion and the patient has the real, you know, critical epidemiologic link to some of the entities, sometimes we just treat empirically. And even, you know, yes, we have, access to serologies, but you'll be surprised. Sometimes I send Bartonella serologies and it takes me, it takes like a whole week for it to be back. So uh, you don't want to sit, you know, for a whole week with a child that, you know, has a fever and you're highly suspecting that. So I think if you have a very strong suspicion of some, you know, some particular infectious etiology and you just, your hands are tied because you're not going to have serologies or you're never going to be able to prove. I think Starting an empiric antibiotic in those situations, I think it's reasonable and see if they respond. Sometimes I have started empiric azithromycin in kids who I am suspecting Bartonella. Let's see, I have micro abscesses in the liver and spleen. I don't wait for the Bartonella serologies to be back. I just start and see if they respond. Even if the serologies are back and those are negative, if they responded, sometimes I just continue because, you know, they responded, they were ill, and now they're better. So I just finish an empiric course. So yes, it just depends on where you are located, which labs you have available. You know, sometimes you just have to, uh, if you have a high index of suspicion of certain infectious etiology. So I think you guys are doing the right thing in those situations. Great, thank you.
Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, we're going to have one more question. Yes. Hello, Dr. Rodriguez. Hello. I'm Dr. Yes, I'm Dr. Kimi. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is this. Do we easily have access to bone marrow in our setting here, even though we have limitation with some other investigation? And I want to know on those children, can we use it if we don't have significant abnormal changes on the CBC? In many occasions here, we did the bone marrow when the CBC was significantly abnormal. And sometimes we got a positive gene expert we have for TB. But I don't know if we don't have significant change on the CBC, complete blood counts. And we are investigating a child for fever of unknown origin. When can we decide to go for bone marrow for culture and histopathology? Yeah, that's a very good question. You know, bone marrow biopsy is some, one of the things that we do kind of like more towards the end of the workup because, you know, this is an invasive procedure. We, you know, most of the time we put the kids under sedation. We call hematology oncology. And they are the ones who decide when to do the bone marrow biopsy. In my experience here, they do it when there is, yes, you know, there are cytopenias, um, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, lymphopenia, neutropenia. But there are some instances that despite a normal or slightly abnormal CBC, if you have a child that you have ruled out most of the infectious causes, uh, you have maybe a rheumatology you know, opinion that they don't think this is rheumatologic, and we still don't find a reason, despite having a not very impressive CBC, sometimes we ask him, yes, can we do it? Because even just for you know, diagnostic purposes for infectious etiology, sometimes we just detect pathogens in bone marrow that we don't detect in blood culture for some reason. I had a child that had disseminated histoplasmosis and we just diagnosed him by bone marrow biopsy. Uh, you know, the smear showed the histoplasma rather than you know, the, the blood culture. So it, you can get a lot of information from bone marrow. I wouldn't do it as a first screening test, but I would say if your initial and maybe middle tier test is negative, I would definitely look there. And another one that you can do before, if you're really thinking about maybe a malignancy or like hematologic malignancy will be a peripheral smear. You do your CBC with differential, but then you all the peripheral smear. And then if that is abnormal, that's gonna push uh, you know, even more uh, hematology oncology to do the bone marrow. Okay, thank you. Please, one You're last welcome. question. Just to know, how often is uh, TB in your setting? How Most often do we see TB here? Yes, I'm how sorry. often do you see TB? How yes. often do we see TB? Yes, not very frequently. Uh, you know, when I am, I am from Colombia, from South America, and, you know, I used to see it very frequently. Here in the U.S., we don't see it very frequently. I would say since I graduated from fellowship 11, 12 years ago, I have had maybe one case of uh, TB lymphadenitis. Um, my partners have had maybe two or three cases of pulmonary TB, but we don't see it very frequently. Uh, um, so I know my adult colleagues might see it a little bit more frequently since you know maybe these patients are like maybe in prison or they are a uh, homeless population, but in pediatric, we don't see it as frequently. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. You're very welcome. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wish to find out the number of blood cultures you generally recommend to be drawn for these patients who we suspect fever of unknown origin. That's a great question. So I would, uh, of course, you know, depending on the size of your patient, um, you know, we always start with one blood culture, but if you have a patient that has endocarditis, for sure we need at least three blood cultures. 
Um, so it just depends of the patient. Sometimes you have an infant that is very hard to obtain a culture. You know, we have to uh, just start with one. But, you know, in a patient with FEO that, you know, you don't, let's see your first blood culture doesn't show anything. I would recommend to do another one 48 hours later. Remember, of course, hopefully without starting antibiotics, you would recommend, you would re repeat another. So I would say at least two blood culture in your workup, but of course, if endocarditis, you have to have at least three blood cultures. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I believe I believe that's all for the team here in Cameroon. Thank you so very much again. And this was really informative and definitely going to be beneficial to the numerous patients we see and we suspect FEO for. So thanks a lot. You're very welcome and thank you for having me. It was my pleasure to be here. Yes, like always, it's we're very, very thankful for all our physician educators who come and answer all our questions. And thank you, Dr. Chinda and team for um, giving us your time as well and for bringing some amazing questions as well. It's always nice to share information like this. I think we learn a lot on our end as well. So um, it's a lot of giving and taking and we're very thankful for the opportunity to do so. Um, so we will see you all next uh, on February 7th, Dr. Chinda. Is that okay with you? Are you guys available? Yes, we should be available. What are we expecting the topic, of course? Yes, of course. I'll have all that to you very soon. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you again for your time. We'll see you in the next one. Always a pleasure to have you. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.